Hi guys and uh, welcome back again and uh, here I am in uh, after all my uh, troubles of yesterday so just to recap uh, the border from uh, in, in, in it uh, from Guatemala to uh, El Salvador was closed it was a it was one of the smaller borders but it was closed because of um, because of a strike and I, you know I didn't I didn't know that and uh, I don't know how one's a strike. Anyway, it, anyway, so that just that border was closed. All, all the people were working were there, but they weren't processing anything. So I um, I then had to go north, about an hour and a half out of my way north to the next border, and then um, I got through that border. It took me about two and a half hours. Uh, then my hotel on my way to San Salvador. My hotel contacted me, telling me that. They were overbooked, they contacted me by email, they didn't actually call me, saying that uh, uh, my book, because I made the booking the day before, and uh, basically they told me, um, sorry, they don't have any rooms left. So then it ended up driving right into there because one of them wanted to see where I could wing it to get them, get me some accommodation or find something for me. And then, um, then I found out uh, uh, that there was just, there was a big, a few big conventions in town and there was just nothing nothing available so anyway, this is in ended up getting into La Libertad and I booked another hotel here and when I got there the hotel's electricity was out and so I couldn't book in there and then they put me into this little hostel around the corner pretty crappy little place real dodgy sort of place but who cares um, and so this is La Libertad it's a bit of a tourist town surfers and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the, the beaches, the water's quite nice here. The beaches have got a, a darker sand to it. It's not like white sandy beaches. Uh, but yeah, it was quite a pretty place. Uh, looked a bit dodgy in areas. Uh, by dodgy, I mean didn't look okay in certain places. A lot of people were really late at night just walking around, not looking like they were tourists, but just sort of looking over fences and looking at cars and stuff like that. So, look, probably a bit of a dodgy place, just got, had that feeling about it. So today I'm going to a place called El Cusco um, in, uh, in El Salvador. And El Cusco is quite a small place, but it's quickly becoming, uh, there's a volcano there in the background, um, it's quickly becoming a, a bit of a tourist destination for people who are a bit more adventurous, but it is a stunning place. Um, and I, I really had a, it, it's probably one of my favourite places. I spent three days there and I would have spent longer there, but uh, unfortunately the hotel that I was staying at and the hotel that I did stay at last, uh, last Vistas Beach Club, uh, Vistas Beach Club, I'll get that right, give me one second. Um, it's called Vistas, Vista La, La Olas Surf Resort. And... I was uh, the only one there <laughs> when I arrived um, and it was a stunning little hotel, only maybe six, ten rooms, something like that. I was the only one there the first night, there was another couple there, got there late the second evening, uh, but oh, I was stunning. And the internet wasn't so bad, it wasn't great, but better than what I'd been having. Um, but just the view, I had a beautiful balcony, I had a beautiful room, beautiful balcony, um, over, and I had a, a cold spa and also a, a, a warm spa. Uh, not that I ever go into the warm spas, especially in summer. Um, and just a little pool, little dip pool, but it was just so beautiful. It was right on the cliff, and there'll be some photos coming up soon regarding that. But so now I'm really into the adventure now. Like, I'm, you know, the highways are now a lot more closed like this, uh, which I love, just going through town after town. You know, here I'm along, I, I'm along the beach. Soon I go inland. And you get into the, the uh, farmland. And we're all, whenever there's farmlands, like um, fruit, uh, fruit farms, like mangoes, palm tree oil, all that sort of stuff, there's people selling stuff all the way along and um, you can get some great food. 
Again, Central America is not disappointed with the food. It's been sensational all the way through. The street food I'm talking about. I hardly went to a restaurant the whole time I was in Central America. I, uh, I had a couple of times I had in-room service, but most of the time I just sat by the side of the road or in, the, in, the, in a town, in a little hut on the side of the road and had the street food. But this, this, is, this, this is what, uh, I mean, people will say adventure, long distance adventure riding is going off road. And in some ways, there's a certain thing to that. But when you're riding solo, going off road for too long can be quite hazardous. Because you, for every for every 200, 300 miles you ride off road and in tough off road, you're going to come off a couple of times. Um, no, normally, the times that I came off, I only came off once at doing a, a decent speed. Uh, actually, twice I came off doing a decent speed, and I really didn't really come off that much. I, I had like a hundred nearlies, um, uh, especially on the, the, the thick Ripio. But look at this, this is just beautiful riding. I just, I just absolutely loved, loved uh, this day. I didn't have a long ride, I only had like four, three or four hours to go, it's not a big country. And as I mentioned previously, I, I had to move reasonably quickly because I was, uh, I was going to um, waving more topes because I, I, I now had about uh, 10 11 days to get to Panama City to get the boat across uh, which wasn't my original plan um, and if you are going to get the boat from Panama to Colombia the star wrap s t a h l s t a h l r a t e um, you book months in advance because it, it's always booked out so here, here I am actually going into a gas station and this young kid was selling like uh, little plastic satchels of water. You'll probably come up soon. Um, yeah, um, he was selling little plastic satchels of water. And uh, I got him to get me a couple of cans of Coke and I got, got all the guys a can of Coke as well. It was stiflingly hot. And um, yeah, here's the, here's the kid. In his bag, he had all these little water things. See the little plastic bags of water? And he sells them all day. He sells them. He sells about 10 of them a day. And he sells them for 50 cents each. So the maximum that kid will make a day, maybe $2.50, $3. Um, but these guys are good. And this kid, this kid was a little bit, um, he had some, uh, some learning disabilities, but he was a really nice kid, I really liked him. Um, so anyway, uh, back on the road again, look at this. And the thing about it is that it, it, when you get into the shade, it actually feels cooler. But it was 30, 35, 90, 95. Um, so it was quite warm. Um, but when you're moving, no matter, even if you've got all your gear on, when you're actually moving, you're not sweating, it feels pretty nice. Like 95 probably feels like about 80. Um, it doesn't feel too bad. It's just when you, you when you slow down in the towns and the sun gets on you and you've got all that gear on and it really starts to heat up. Um, and, and the riding gear that I use is the climb, climb riding gear. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about my riding gear as far as my clothing goes. Um, so I, I, I had uh, uh, the Climb uh, K-L-I-M Overlander pants and jacket. I've also got the Badlands pants and jacket, but they're really, really heavy. And I'm glad I didn't take them, even though they're a lot more, a lot safer, I just decided to go up here. The map told me I had a bit of a, bit of a detour through here to, um, to get to the other side of the highway. So I thought I'd go for, go for that. Um, but yeah, the climb, so I had climb riding gear. I, I took three pairs of socks. Now, pretty much every night you basically got to uh, um, put a pair of socks in, in, in the basin and soak them in the, uh, I have this, uh, this uh, something suds, I can't remember what it is, camp suds. And uh, this is where I started to worry that I, I made a bad move. Um, but, um, yeah, just soak them in there and then the next day you just tie them to one of your bags 
when they dry at the end of the trip. Uh, but you want to keep your, your socks nice and fresh. Uh, also, it doesn't hurt to, you know, to get some um, some uh, some foot odor powder or whatever protects your feet, because you're going to be basically your feet are going to be sweating every single day. Um, and just to put a bit of a, you know, I always put the boots outside if I could at night um, and give them a bit of air and put some of that powder, powder in there. Try again in a few seconds. That's fine. I can't say the name of it. Um, home assistant device. Um, but uh, yeah, so I the, the climb riding gear, I mean, it got pretty smelly. <laughs> Um, you know, because it, if you wash it, you basically got to wash it in warm water and um, and soap, and it takes probably in in the humid condition, it takes 24 hours to dry minimum. Um, so I didn't wash them that often, um, but they held up strong. No zippers broke. Um, I actually on the pants one button broke, but uh, that was all. And um, but they, yeah, the jacket is as good as new after six months and you know, 40,000 kilometers. So, yeah, um, the, the boots I'm trying to think of what they what the boots are. So, I've got them here, they're, they're, uh, they're, Day, they're the Daytona Roadstar GTX, and they lasted me the whole trip. The, the soles on them have got a bit worn. Um, and I had them for 12 months beforehand as well, but when I first got them, uh, the Daytona Road Stars, they were the most uncomfortable shoes I've ever had in my life. But after about a month of wearing them, they're now, I mean, I can wear them and they just feel like other shoes. They're just so comfortable. Uh, everything lasted on those except for the last day when I went for a ride, the zipper broke. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so I bought, I bought a zipper repair kit because uh, I want to use them still because I like them and they they're so both the Overlander gear and the um, the boots are both waterproof so I, I went through some massive showers especially in Panama I mean Panama nearly rained every single day I was there and nearly the whole time it was raining I had about four or five hours one day where it didn't rain and I got out on the bike and went for a drive but other than that it was pretty bad <laughs> Um, and I didn't get wet underneath at all, you know, really good. The only other thing I would suggest is for your neck, because the water will get up in that area, is to get like a neck scarf or if you can get some, a, a, like a, a water resistant um, neck scarf. And especially once you get down into Patagonia, you want some warmth, or warmth around your neck. Um, you know, and you know, the gloves I had, Two different types of gloves. I had the summer, my summer gloves, which I'm wearing now, I think, and um, and I also had my um, I had my hardcore gloves. So whenever I went off road, I wore those, um, and I lost a, I lost one on a really I had them behind the back on a really bumpy road, and I took them off, and uh, one of them just fell off. Um, it was in it, it was in uh, Bolivia in the uni, Bolivia, where the hotel was, had the, probably the worst road I've ever ridden on in my life, to the actual hotel, all, all salt crystals and potholes every, there, there was six inches pothole, six inches pothole, six inches pothole, all potholes, various depths, absolutely disgusting. And you know, the road that took, went out there had like about four or five star hotels on it, path pathetic, and everything about those hotels were pathetic, and I'll talk about them when I get to them. Um, but yeah, so I had three pairs of socks. Make sure you get the right type of socks, the ones that are high wicking, um, and make sure they're comfortable. Wear, don't get new socks and then start wearing them day one. Uh, wear them in a little bit so they're nice and comfy and stretchy. Um, and yeah, so you, you're going to need protection gloves and really good solid protection and waterproof and windproof uh, gloves. Uh, especially when you get down to Patagonia because it gets frighteningly cold. And uh, the last thing you want, and even with the gloves that I had, and I had inners as well, even with those gloves, I still got you know, numb fingers at the end and stuff like that, you just have to put up with it. But the rest of my body was pretty good. I, I didn't get too cold, um, you know, 
it, I was cold, but to get, you know, I, I also had a thermals as well that I wore underneath once I got down there. Um, and they were pretty good. I, I bought one set and they weren't so good. Excuse me for one second. Sorry about that. I got a phone call. It was actually my motorbike, so I had to answer it. I'm getting it serviced. So the first service after my trip, and it's costing me about $2,500. <laughs> but I needed a new front rim, and that's like $1,000 something dollars because I, I, I damaged it on the Honduras border. Uh, the Honduras Nicaragua border. Uh, probably one of the worst roads I've ever ridden on. Uh, the last 30, 40 miles uh, hit a pothole about six inches, eight inches deep, and just about six feet long, and it just threw me from a bike. Uh, um, also damaged my rear rim beyond repair. I, I was able to to limp it into uh, to Columbia, uh, but it was bent really badly, um, uh, and then the front rim lasted the trip but was pretty pretty badly damaged as well uh, but we got I got that pretty look going pretty well it was just leaking really slowly but anyway back to the riding gear so and, and with your thermals if you can test them if you can get them test them anywhere in really cold weather test them because I had two sets of thermals one set was from REI, REI and they didn't work properly and then I bought a, a, a set of Halley Hansen thermals and they were a lot better the REI ones were thicker, but they didn't provide, they weren't, the air would get through them. Um, they said that they were for, uh, you know, extreme cold, but they, they were crap. Um, so, yeah, so any, and, and what you want to do after your first few months, you what, what might be smart to do if you know someone in, say, Chile, in Santiago or somewhere around that area, depending what time of year you're going. If you know someone there, get get your cold weather gear sent there. Uh, get sent, get it sent somewhere. Even if you send it to yourself via a post office or something like that, or pick up at a UPS store. Just time it well and get someone to send it on a certain date. So it gets there and it might be there for four or five days by the time you get there, who cares? But instead of carrying all that gear around, and, and by the time you've done about a month of travel, if you know what the weather conditions approximately are going to be like, so highs and lows, you can't deal with the extremes either way. Uh, you can't do much about that. But if you've got, if you can do something about uh, that, get rid of all the stuff you're not wearing. Just get rid of it. You're not using. If you're not using it, just get rid of it because it's just extra weight. And I learned that the hard way. And I probably shed three times the whole trip. I shed stuff. So once I got to Santiago, Chile. Once I got to Colombia, I, I got rid of a whole heap of stuff. And then once I got to Santiago, Chile, I got rid of a, a, even more stuff. Because uh, I was on my last, the last leg of the journey and just got rid of all the extra batteries. Basically, each, each time I shed, I got rid of about 15 kilos of stuff, 10 to 15 kilos of stuff. So by the time I was hitting all the dirt down south, I was, I was basically um, riding you know, riding pretty pretty uh, light. Here's another thing, another hint. You'll see on the sides of the roads, uh, you'll see all along the way, you'll see little stop-offs. And you can see there, if it's shaded, you've got somewhere you can lay down and stretch, go for it. Uh, that's the best way to do it. I, I always look for, you know, you can look for places where you sit, but you're sitting most of the time anyway. But somewhere like a bench or something you can lay down on, and like all these food stalls along the side of the road, some of them are empty and I've got seats in them and they've got a cover. Perfect, perfect place to have a little rest stop. Um, as far as as far as how far you should ride each day, if you really want to enjoy it, enjoy everything, you, the Google Maps should show between three and four hours of riding, because then you can stop off in towns along the way. Like I. Most of the trip I was doing five, six hours a day, eight hours a day, and then for the really boring roads, I was knocking out 13 hours in a day to get between two major places. Um, but the three to four hour, a four hour ride, like today's ride, which was a four hour ride, is the perfect riding day. 171 kilometers, 100 miles. You know, if, you can, if you've got the time to do that, that's the way you do it, because then you can stop off in each town, Take your gear off, walk around, you know, always keep your bike sighted. 
uh, wherever you go. So always, if you park it as close by as you can and keep keep an eye, eye on it, um, and you should be fine. And like, have all your valuables. Like I have all my all my important things are in my backpack, and the, the, all the other stuff is in my tank bag. If people steal stuff, it'll be bad for me. Any of the other stuff, but it's not going to be trip ending or trip delaying. You know, so. Another, another secret is if you're going to park your bike outside and you've got your side cases leave them un and, and they're empty, leave them unlocked. Because that way you'd rather somebody open them up and find there's nothing in there than, than smash them and try to open them to find there's nothing in there. Okay. Here's overtaking trucks and that's you. You'll spend half your life doing that on this trip. And there's nothing worse than, than having trucks and on dirt roads because all the dust that flies up with you and, and stuff like that can be quite quite uh, quite demanding on you after a while. And I, I remember taking my helmet off a few times and you take the helmet off and you'd have this smile of dirt around your face. Um, but you just get used to it. And the, the thing about it is, um, it depends on your budget, but like if if you can, whenever you whenever you look for a hostel, look for a hostel with a swimming pool because plenty of them do have them. They might be pretty tacky, some of them and that, but at least it's somewhere to jump in at the end of the day and give yourself a bit of a refresher. I mean, I went through a process every day at the end of my ride. I unpacked my bag, my bike, and then I plugged in everything, so I ever, got everything charged up that I needed for the following day. So that's the first thing I did. Even if I was just ridiculously tired, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have my beers or anything like that. I'd get that stuff out of the way. Just once you've got all your gear in, um, gear inside, um, and you know, try to try to be smart when you're researching hotels, hostels where you've got parking. You can park your bike inside. You can a lot of with Google with uh, searching Google you, at each location, you can look at the photos and you can find out. Okay, what's the because they're it's not only the the, pe the 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 premises that submits their photos, but also people that travel there. So always have a look at that and, and see. Okay, that's got somewhere I can park my bike. You'll find that nearly every hostel, even the, a lot of the hotels, the bigger hotels don't give a give a shit about. Have a look at this car in front of me. About 15 people in a in a Ute, all hanging on, crazy. But that you see that everywhere. Um, but yeah, um, big hotels are less accommodating on everything. You know, no, you can't park your bike there. No, you can't do that. So I just didn't really like the big hotels, you know. Um, it is by far your biggest expense though. So if you're, if you're doing a budget, spend your time. I mean, I never booked in advance because you never know what's going to happen. I usually book the day before or a couple of days before or even the same day in a lot of circumstances. Because I was riding in the off season, I had a little bit more flexibility on, on what, what, when I would go, uh, where I'll go and what, what I would do. Um, so, but look for, the things I always look for are comments on the Wi-Fi. Look for uh, photos to see if there's, there's parking on site. Usually the, the, the hostels will tell you whether there's parking on the site or not. Um, and whether it's free parking, it, it's all pretty much always free. Some of the hostels I stayed in let me rock, push my bike inside, you know, they were really cool. Um, most of them try to accommodate you no matter what, you know, um, and so I really, I really appreciated that. Um, I always booked private hostel rooms rather than public ones, uh, well, rather than the dormitories because I just don't, I've got too much gear I don't want to um, think. So check, I always check Wi-Fi, I check the Wi-Fi comments, not what they say, what any comments on the Wi-Fi. Um, I, I check um, uh, parking. And then I might check to see if they've got a pool or a, or a balcony, uh, somewhere where you can sit outside and just relax at night. And you know, I mean, I love having a cigar. And uh, and you know, one of my clients kept sending me Cubans, so I was pretty happy. Um, and a cigar would last me four or five nights, one cigar. So I wouldn't do it all at once, obviously. Yeah, it is me trying to take a truck on the inside. Not, not the smartest move on earth, but. 
you, you, you'll get used to that. And a lot of the trucks, you just sort of, I sort of waited there. You can, um, this is a two speed. Um, I sort of waited there and then he, I saw that the truck, it, it saw me and you could tell by the way the truck aligned itself a little bit. It saw me on the inside and then just straightened itself up to give me the space. I, I love the truckies. The truckies were fantastic on the whole trip. Um, you know, I only had a couple of little bad experiences with them. Uh, bus drivers are a completely different story altogether. Um, uh, they, they, they're crazy and uh, you just, you know, you really got to have your wits about you. Even riding here, you know, you're always, I mean, I'm still learning on this trip and, you know, it, you wait till you get to Chile and Peru, uh, Peru and Ecuador and places like that where it's just insanity. Um, uh, one of my friends that I met, one of the guys I met along the way, Sam, has a little short video, Sam Shepard, I think his name is Sam Shepard. Um, no, I don't think it's Sam Shepard. It sounds too, someone like a movie star or something. Um, um, Sam, he has a video of him riding just like this, and then there's a bus overtaking on the other side. Um, and, and he basically had to go onto the shoulder of the road. And he gave the bus driver the bird, which I thought was pretty impressive, considering he was trying to control the bike. So this is coming into a uh, 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 surf resort, surf town, a little, a little town called um, uh, El Cusco. Um, El Cusco. El Cusco. Why can't I ever remember these things? It's embarrassing. El Cusco. Um, and uh, yeah, gorgeous little place. About four miles, five miles off the off the main off the main highway on uh, towards the beach. Um, it took me a little while to find the place because it was up a, up a hill, and I made a couple of little wrong turns along the way. You'll find that your Google Maps and uh, the Garmin as, as well aren't so flashy in, in these sort of towns. Uh, even though I, you know, the one thing I hate about Garmin is I make the purchase maps. So I purchased the Central and South America pack and it had a couple of countries that were missing, but even the countries they had, it was pretty poor. Uh, Google Maps was a lot better. Uh, even though the only, the only downside of Google Maps is that it had no idea uh, in a lot of the towns which ones were one-way streets um, and which weren't. Uh, and that, be that can become a problem. Um, and it can get a little bit frustrating, but uh, you just got to put up with it. <laughs> you know, it's your best option. The other, the other way is hand maps, and I always had hand maps for each country that I got to. And you know, I used to use the hand maps for just working out if I could take short, not not shortcuts because they always took longer, but between two mate, two highways or anything like that where there was cut across. Um, and another thing to think about with the cut crosses uh, are the, uh, they're usually dirt roads, always dirt roads, and sometimes they're on farmland and the farmers lock the gates. Um, so I only, I, it was only once or twice I got stuck for, you know, one, a couple of times it happened and uh, I had to wait for someone to come along. And, um, and one, one time I had to wait over an hour uh, for a guy, but I'd already, I was too far into the road to bother. And I thought if I get stuck here, I'm just going to camp the night. Um, but uh, yeah, sometimes they have gates across the road because they've got uh, livestock and they fencing. So uh, I don't know why they're allowed to do to lock them. They probably aren't by law, but because uh, it is a public road. But um, yeah, it is what it is. Once I knew about them, I I just thought, well, if I take the cut cut across, then I don't really. I don't really care, I can camp there the night. It's not that big a deal. And some of those are really fun roads. Usually the roads, the dirt roads that weren't, that were just left alone, were usually a lot better than the roads that they try to service because they just throw rock all over it and it just makes it really slippery. And, you know, six inches of crushed rock is not fun to ride on. Um, not as fun to ride on as something that's like hard. The, the only thing is, is that the old dirt roads that aren't getting looked after when it rains, they can be pretty treacherous. Um, but, you know, you just roll with it. When you're on an adventure like this, you just go for it. You just don't really care. Um, yeah, so uh, we, I think I'm coming into the, the town now.
It was a little bit of a weird place at first because it had like parts sectioned off, um, but it was really, really pretty. And, and it had like massively long beaches, like one or two kilometres long. Um, and uh, there's quite a few hostels here. I'd stay, I, you know, because it was the off season, I was getting really good deals on hotels. This one here was about $100 a night, which was probably more than I would have wanted to spend. But uh, I just decided that, hey, you know, have a few days break after the day before and get say somewhere nice. And it ended up being probably the best hotel I stayed in the whole trip. If the Wi-Fi was better, I would have given it, I gave it four stars on Google. If the Wi-Fi had been better, I would have given it five stars. I get lost here a bit, actually. End up, I end up riding onto the beach. I don't know why I decided that was a better move. Um, but there was a road there, and I, I think I think because the map was telling me there's something around. There's a couple of pigs there. That's what you, you see a fair bit of that. The, the following night, I went for it, took my bike off the beach for a ride. It was nice. Still don't know where I am. Still trying to work out. I'm up there on the hill somewhere. I know that much. As you can see, there's no one there. It was pretty much empty, except for local villages. And there's quite a lot of people fishing. So they go out in those boats there and they go fishing, netting. Sand is always good fun too, guys. And I've got some photos here of the place. I probably didn't do it justice by um, by how I um, by how I uh, photographed it because I could have probably done a better job. Now I'm still working it out, and I think oh, I think I've got to go right up here. This guy's not going to help me out though. <laughs> Big heavy bike, not not, not the most. Oh, I, think I screwed up there. I should have gone left up there. I think. Still working it out. A lot of dogs. I oh, know that's where I went up here. I'm pretty sure I get this right now. Peels off up to the right. Yeah. And my hotel is right up there on the cliff. Yeah, just up here. I'm right a little bit past it actually, from memory. Yep, there we go. I was pretty happy. By the time I'd seen this, and I could see down in there, I was a pretty happy camper. Thinking, look at that, that's beautiful. And you know, all, all, all these sort of places, I was the only one staying here at this time. Um, there's just the people working here. That was it. Look at that spa bath. I was right up there on that first balcony at the top there. Pretty happy camper I was. Pretty happy camper. Look at that pool. What do they call them? Infinity pools or whatever. So that's a little roadside stop I was telling you about. You could even put something there. And that's the hotel. Pretty nice, eh? Hey? There's my bike. That's after the kid, kids washed it. There's a couple of young kids there, I gave them some money to wash my bike. The kids are the owners, all the people managing the property. That's the view at night from my balcony, pretty nice, eh? Hey? There's the pool. The spa there on the left. That's just one of the beaches there. That's another panoramic view of the beach. You, you, I make those photos by just taking three or four photos in Google, uh, on my phone, sorry, and uploading to Google. So I take them next to each other, just try to keep my hands steady. One, two, three, four diff different photos, and then they, Google does an amazing job of stitching them together. There you can see the fishing boats. They're lined up everywhere, They're about four or five of them pull them out, they jump in and they go out netting and they come back and catch whatever they can catch, put in the, some guys playing some, they, they, these guys were just walking from place to place, but it was off season, so they weren't making much money. It's a pretty relaxed little town. It's beautiful. Nice beach, you can see one of the boats getting ready to go out. They're all resting. 
That's the hotel there on the cliff. Pretty nice. Pretty good stitching job from Google too. There it is again. All that beach to myself. Not bad, eh? Alright guys, um, as usual, any questions or comments below? Hope you have a great day.